So the thing about animal behavior we have to look at, first of all, dogs have co-evolved with man. I gave a lecture at UCLA not too long, or a few years ago, that talked about the co-evolution of dogs. And dogs are really the only animal that has co-evolved with us completely and has completely integrated into our lives. Dogs will choose to be with humans over other dogs. Like if I'm playing with my dog and another dog walks by, he's going to choose to stay with me as opposed to being with another animal of his own species. That is the, one of the most unique behaviors that we can attribute to dogs and humans, right? So our co-evolution has spanned, they say, close at least 10 to 15,000 years possibly more, possibly up to 100,000 years. So if you look at any of the programs on um, man's exodus from Africa, that's when we started domesticating the, what animal? What animal did the dog spawn from? The wolf, right. So a dog is more closely related to a wolf than even any other animal that, that goes. And your common chihuahua house dog has more in common with a wolf than it does with any other animal as well. So. All behaviors that are innate into the, the, the personality, we should say, or the drives of the dog, are stemmed from the wolf. And those behaviors are what we call drives. And does anybody know what drives means? Drives are the subconscious energy or, or actions that a dog will exhibit during times of stress, during times of, of need, or anything like that. So we have things, the basic two drives that dogs have are a preservation of the species drive and a self-preservation drive. Everything stems from there, right? So just like you, if a bunch of aliens came down you would, and they were trying to kill us, we would all fight together to fight off the aliens. But if somebody starts to fight you, you're going to fight to protect yourself. So of those two drives, which one do you think is stronger? The self-preservation or the preservation of the species? Anybody? Okay, so let me I'll give you an example and then tell me if you stay, if you stay with your thought, right? So on a self-preservation species, if somebody comes up to me and says, I'm going to kick your butt, right? And then, and the guy is a big, burly, mean-looking, tattooed, crazy, muscly guy, I have two options. What are my options? Fight or run. Flee or flee, fight or flee, right? I can run away or I can stand and fight. That's the self-preservation drive. So those are the two components that go into the self-preservation drive. The other drive, the preservation of the species drive, is somebody comes up and starts murdering my mother, my father, my child, my aunt. What am I going to do? Am I going to flee? No, I'm going to fight. So the preservation of the species drive actually is a stronger drive innately, subconsciously, in all creatures. Right? If I die, it's one thing. If I run away, it's one thing. But if, I, if everybody around me dies and the species dies off, it's much more powerful. Right? So, and you'll see that like when you see a lion hunting a bunch of gazelles in Africa. Right? He's running, 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 and everybody's running, 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 and then boom, one nails it. Well, what they do is they kind of go on and go, okay, well, we lost one. Right? They don't go in. Now, if, if somebody was sort of sh going after a bunch of lions, lions would go out and, and fight. But one on, they generally kind of let it go. So really important to do that, to, to think about that. And when we think about animal behavior, or what we're talking about here is how animals work, or how dogs in particular work, there's only two things that really motivate any of us. What are those? I've been talking about it for a week. What's that? What, what motivates us to do anything? There's, there's one is a positive and one is a negative. Pleasure and pain, right? All animals seek to avoid pain and to pursue pleasure, right? So if you can go um, walk on nails to get to class or you can walk on soft grass, which one are you going to do? Walk on soft grass, right? So when you look at an animal's behavior or an animal's actions or the way an animal exudes itself, it's based on simply finding pleasure. Right? So if an animal can find pleasure through eating, through resting, through playing, or anything like that, or reproduction, which pleasure is this, the, the, the sex drive is in the pleasure drive, then the animal follows that drive. In avoiding pain, they're going to know, okay, I don't want to fight four or five big guys. But if I can fight that guy and take his food, 
I'll take that fight because I can win that fight and I can pursue pleasure that way, right? So what you have to think about the way animals think in very rudimentary terms because they don't communicate verbally. There's certain animals that will communicate verbally. For example, mountain gorillas have a very complex form of communication with each other. I was just spent um, three weeks in Africa and I spent time in Rwanda with the mountain gorillas. And you'll see that the, the trackers in Africa, in, in Rwanda, can actually communicate with these gorillas. So when the little gorilla comes up and starts beating his chest and, and, and playing the tough guy and gets too close, the trackers will push the gorilla back with a sound, a <coughs> sound. And that sound teaches the gorilla to back off. Because when the big silverback does it, everybody backs off. There is no question, right? So it was an amazing trip I had there, and it taught me a lot more about animal behavior because I'm fascinated by, by all this stuff. So it's not to me just my job to train dogs. It's my job to help animals have a better life, right? So that's where I put my goal. So I was a really good dog trainer. I made money and I did all this stuff. And um, I realized that by taking what I knew and teaching it, to people who needed it. Somebody said to me once, uh, this is going back a long time, like nine, 10 years, and this lady said, can you help take a look at this dog and give me an evaluation on the dog? And I said, I, I said, I'm busy. And she said, well, if I was you, I would do what you do all day for free. And I said, that's a really good idea. All I gotta do is teach a bunch of people to do what I do, and they can do it for free, and then I don't have to do as much, right? So that became really the, the mindset to Bound Angels. Let's take what we know, what can help somebody else or help another animal, and let's teach it to as many people as we can. And that's what I started doing with, with Bound Angels University, teaching shelter employees how to better work with dogs. So shelter dogs and dogs and wolves are almost three very different animals. They're all the same species, right? But when a dog goes into a shelter, he ceases to become a dog. And the reason for that is because behaviorally he's shutting down. He's becoming something different. He's going into a very high stress situation. So his behaviors will adapt to that. Now, the topic of what we're talking about here today is using dogs for uh, behaviors and, and, and training them and stuff like that. And I'm gonna get into all that, but I wanna give you a little background on how dogs work, because I think it's the most important part of what you're, we're gonna learn today. So when dogs change their behavior, when they get into that fight or flight mode, which we just talked about, that's when things change in the dog's mind. When we're full in pleasure mode, and have any of you guys studied like animal behavior, like as it relates to um, like optimal based training, on R plus training, anything like that? As no. it relates to what? As it relates to uh, like uh, condition training, like uh, Pavlovian training. Oh, okay, great, okay. So you've studied some animal behavior yes. and animal psychology, good. So a lot of currently, we're seeing a lot of movement since the animal psychology has become much more popular is this movement towards what, what, what is in layman's term called positive only training or R plus training, right? In that psychology, what we're looking at, sadly, and I'm glad you guys are, are here to, to listen to what I'm saying because I'm, out there dealing with real dogs, not in a lab dealing with 12 golden retrievers, um, it, it, ha it tends to be a death sentence for dogs because we're limiting the, the, the things we can do on dogs. It's kind of like saying, okay, we have a really good hospital, but we're not going to use an electric defibrillator because it's just too, it's too aversive, right? It's just that when I put the pads on the person, the person shocks and it might kill them, but it might save them. So now I'm not saying that electric collars are the answer or, or pinch calls are the answer, but I'm saying a, a variety of training methods is the answer. And what we need to look at is what does a dog need to succeed in life? Just like what does a person need to succeed in life? And that overall answer is structure, right? When I came in here, I stopped at the red light. I turned left from the left turn lane. I went, I stopped at the security guard. I got my pass. I turned right here and I parked my car. I didn't just like zip up the middle of PCH and flip a UE and then come in here and park in the middle of the field. Because I understand that structure is a guideline for life. And that's where dogs tend to break down when they end up in a shelter. Somebody gave up on them, either they were too big, too small, they barked too much or barked too little, or they were too old or too young, they couldn't be trained or they were too dominant. And all these behaviors you see because people give up on dogs. So 
What we'd want to look at is how to condition behaviors, and I'll bring Goofy out in one second and show you just a couple of behaviors, and I'll bring them in and out a couple of times so that you guys have a time to see him and a time to um, observe what he's doing and then time to ask me questions, and it gives him a break to kind of be away from us because he, he'll get crazy, he'll want to play with everybody. So, um, and when he comes out, just ignore him. Try not to, like, he'll start, he'll want to lick you and stuff like that, but I'll get him away from you. But um, is anybody here afraid of dogs? Oh, you aren't really? Okay. So you're going to be an actress today. You're going to pretend you're not afraid of dogs, right? Just ignore. So the best thing, and it's a really good thing, why are you afraid of dogs? Were you bitten at one point? No. No? Okay. But you're just, you're just afraid. They're big. Okay. Well, there's a big dog coming out, so. <laughs> um, so, um, very common that dogs, I'm not saying this to scare you in any way, because he won't bite you, but dogs will bite people who are afraid of them. It's like dogs are common to bite children. Because what happens is, in a dog's drive, the self-preservation and the preservation of the species drive, they see that apprehension that you might have as a negative. So they see that as something suspicious, like, why are you afraid of me? I'm not going to hurt you. But if you're acting suspicious, perhaps you want to hurt me. And that's just rooted so deeply in the animal's behavior that it's hard to unwire without exposing them over and over to that, which is why at very young ages we take dogs out and we um, bring them around children and people who don't know what they're, who, who they are about loud sounds, slippery surfaces and stuff like that to overall condition them to that, right? But when we look at training dogs or training animals for behaviors, anybody um, seeing like what they do at SeaWorld with the, 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 the whale stuff? Do you guys see blackfish by the way? Okay. Um, which side are you more on? Just curious. It has nothing to do with the lecture, but are you more on the side of the people training the, 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 the mammals or the people who are against the training of the mammals? I'm cool with the training. You're cool with the training? You're against it? <laughs> Just raise your hands if, you're, if you like the training of those animals. Okay, and, if, and then raise your hand if you're against it. Okay. All right, well, thank God. Cause, okay, and I'm against it only in the sense that uh, for exhibition. Okay. Right? Uh, I think it's fun. I think I, I've seen the shows. Yeah. They are exciting, but it's so unnatural. Right. And, and they're in such tight quarters. Right. Um, although I know that some of these aquaria also do uh, good in terms sure. of uh, conservation in the wild. Right. So that's actually really nice to hear a professor saying that because most often than not, it's very black and white. It's very dogmatic. scientific. Yes, yeah, dogmatic. So I'm against it. I mean, I am all for training dogs because dogs have been domesticated and co evolved with us for at least 15,000 years, you know? So you have to think about how many cycles of dogs there have been in those 15,000 years. There's been hundreds of thousands of cycles of dogs that have gone through and have co-evolved with us. So they're actually looking to us for that. Whenever you look at mammal training, for example, um, and I'm gonna stay with sea mammals for now. So if you look at a whale, all that training is based on what they consider positive only training. So in other words, the dog, the, the dog, <laughs> The, the, the whale is lured with a fish, which means if, it, if he's full, he's not gonna come up to you for one fish. So you tend to have to deprive them of that, which we'll do with a dog. If a dog is not working properly, we'll deprive them one or two meals and then show them that they can get their meal by exhibiting a certain behavior. Uh, finding the bad guy, finding the dope, um, biting the bad guy or jumping through a hoop, whatever that trick is or whatever the behavior is, it's very natural for the dog to want to do it because he's co-evolved with us for so many years and he wants to relate to us. The dog is just really looking for a way to relate to us and other animals aren't. So whales generally tend to be avoidant of humans, like lions. They're very, if you step out of the car with a lion, the lion will flee, you know? Now, if you pressure the lion, the lion will kill you, right? And which is what we've seen now with a lot of the, um, trainers, not a lot, but a few of the trainers, who have been training these crazy big animals with positive only. There's no really, there's no downside to the animal because they've never, you can't punish, how are you going to punish a, a four ton uh, whale? You know, you can't hit him on the nose with a stick, you know, so, and you can't put him on a leash and drag him around to the other pool and have a word with him. So it's, it's going to be much harder to ever pass that level of training onto whales that we have on dogs. Because dogs have a neck, dogs have four legs, they walk with us, they stay with us, they're conditioned to behave with us. 
And they're very conditioned to want to please us, which is the root of my talk here, right? That dogs want to please us. We just have to show them how they can please us. Even dogs that are completely despondent and checked out or whatever, they've just checked out because they don't think they can please us, right? But if we show them, hey, I just start hand feeding the dog, I start playing with the dog, I start showing the dog this, this is a fun relationship, it's going to spark that right back into the dog's mind. Even a dog that's feral, because feral dogs are really only labeled feral dogs when they've been twice removed from domestication. What's the word feral mean? Feral is wild, right? Resorting to the wild, right? Secondarily wild, right? Secondarily. You've got a domestic animal right. that it goes loose. Correct. It has to be, yeah, like, so in other words, if my dog went and became feral, so I started living in the wild without me, okay, then he had a puppy, and then that dog had a dog, that next dog is considered truly feral. Because the first dog is still learning the behaviors from him, who is a domesticated dog, oh, yeah. right? This dog is it's not going to be able to pass on to that. So, and as you get more and more down line, but even feral dogs, because of their DNA, can easily be conditioned back into society, back into domestication and, and, and human habituation.